Hi, is your child prone to tantrums or meltdowns? Uh, today's video, we're going to be talking about how to survive a major meltdown or tantrum. Now, I do have some other videos that are on the lines of preventing tantrums or meltdowns. Uh, however, my uh, belief about this is for some kids, especially special needs kids, kids on the autism spectrum, not all of them can be prevented. And so therefore we have to have some strategies to get through a meltdown if it occurs. Uh, so that's what today's topic is. Uh, and when a meltdown happens, it starts with a trigger. So those are the things that if we know what they are, if we know what sets off a tantrum or a meltdown, those are the things we can try to prevent through various strategies, um, uh, modifying the environment and not bringing your child to certain situations that might be likely to trigger that. But occasionally there are times when we can't avoid a trigger um, or we didn't know to expect it. So we just can't predict everything that might trigger a large emotional reaction. So there's times we just cannot prevent that trigger from setting some strong emotions into um, action. So the next step that happens in a meltdown is the phase I call the build-up phase. So if we haven't been able to prevent a meltdown by avoiding the trigger, the build-up phase is the time when we have a chance of making a difference. All right, now the reason I say that we have a chance of making a difference is as soon as the strong emotions start to kick in for the child's brain, the frontal cortex area of the brain, which is the executive functioning area, you know, located in this part of your head um, that involves planning and reasoning and problem solving, that part's starting to be impacted by the strong emotions. So you've got the fight or flight reflexes kicking in and the uh, child just isn't really able to think as well. Now, um, your fight or flight response might be starting to kick in as well as you're reacting to your child's meltdown, so you might have a harder time thinking and reasoning as well. So those two things combined can lead to some trouble. So what we want to do first is for you as the adult to try to focus on staying calm. That's the best thing that you could do in the situation, and yet the hardest. I mean, it is just really hard to stay calm if a child is... Uh, starting to rage or throw things or hit or get really escalated. So it's extremely difficult sorry, to keep calm like that. And so uh, what you can do is to really focus on taking deep breaths, on realizing, trying to remember that this is not personal. This is not happening because of something to do with you or something that you've done wrong, even if you have done something wrong, it still doesn't cause this kind of huge meltdown to occur. That's usually because of some neurological condition that the child has, like say maybe they're on the autism spectrum and therefore um, something triggered them that again you might not have been able to predict. So even if you didn't handle it perfectly or you got a little mad or something like that, you didn't really cause this. What the cause was, was something usually in the child's brain that's causing this kind of emotional escalation. So to try not to take it personally or to get into the specifics of what it is that's happening. So if the child's upset because you have said no or you won't let them do something or you won't go out and get them something that they wanted, um, remember not to get into those specifics, not to be thinking about them, and also not even to be engaging the child about those specifics, but instead just start thinking, what can I do to help my child be calm? Um, and what can I do to help myself stay calm so that I can manage the situation? Sometimes you might also work on some tag teaming. If there's another adult in the home, this would be a good time to notify that person that I might need some help and even have made an agreement ahead of time that if one parent is starting to lose their cool, if there's another adult in the home or another parent, to tag team with that person. And for people who don't have another adult in the home, you might want to consider neighbors or friends that you could contact at a time like this, uh, especially if it's someone close by that could pop on over <laughs> quickly. Um, and again, do it in a way where you're not having any negative judgments about yourself, but to say, my child is prone to meltdowns, this is because he has an autism spectrum disorder, for instance, if that's the cause. Um, 
and uh, sometimes I might need some help staying calm. Now, if you are going to bring in someone like a neighbor, of course, you want to have a plan ahead of time where you've maybe told them what they can do to help and so forth, so they aren't just walking in unprepared. But uh, the basic idea is you want to have, if at all possible, an adult who's able to stay calm in the situation with the child. Uh, you can begin to call the child by their name. Now, not the kind of angry name where we call them by their first, middle, and last name in a really angry tone, and we only use that voice with them when we're really upset with them. Not that kind of calling them by name, but just using a gentle voice, using their first name, and speaking in very slow and simple sentences. This is not the time to lecture them or to teach them a lesson about their behavioral issues. Um, this is just a time to remind the child that they need to calm down. And one thing you want to do is tell them what you want them to do instead of what you don't want them to do. So instead of saying, stop yelling, you know, you'd say, please use a quiet voice. Or if they're running around the house or in your face and following you around, you might say, please go to your room. Uh, and at first you might make a gentle request, like please go to your room. Once you've said it once, if the child still hasn't gone, then you want to just up it just a little bit and say, go to your room. Again, still using a, a gentle voice, uh, but it's gone from a request to an instruction. Uh, and, but again, you're staying calm, you're telling them what you want them to do. And if you have helped the child learn some behaviors that they can use to calm themselves down when they're stressed, like, for instance, if they've set up a calm down spot and maybe they have some fidgets or a book or some music to listen to in that special calm down spot, uh, which is a good strategy to use for kids that are prone to meltdowns, so you're going to be encouraging them to go to their special spot. You know, I need you to go to your calm down spot or I need you to go to your room. Uh, and remember not to be negotiating about whatever it was that upset them in the first place. So what, because of course, you never want to give in to this kind of behavior and then change your mind as a result of it because then you've just reinforced tantruming. Um, but also, nobody's brain is working well at this point. It's not the right time to be negotiating or trying to compromise. All you want to do is help the child focus on calming down. Now you might want to say that you'll discuss the situation with them later, um, but not at that time that they're upset. So that's during the build-up phase, so you're using a calm voice, very simple sentences, short direct instructions, uh, getting down maybe towards on the child's level and not looking, you know, like a big or threatening person, um, but only, and decide with your child's special needs whether you'd get close or stay a little farther back. If they're prone to lashing out or getting physically aggressive, you want to stay away a little bit so that you're not gonna easily get hit or hurt. Um, but if it would be more reassuring to the child if you approached a little more closely, you might do that. So, but you want to kind of lower your physical presence so that you don't look um, you know, big and threatening uh, to the child. But you want to look calm and in control. Calm and in control. <laughs> you know, and again, that's really hard to do, but that's the goal. Okay, now what I've noticed for kids who are prone to meltdowns is that you can be using these strategies in that build-up phase, but there is a stage called the explosion or the blow-up, and I think that there's a certain point in the cycle where there's a point of no return. And once you're at that point, you're going to stop the strategies of trying to tell them what to do and so forth, because if you're at the stage of an actual big meltdown or blow-up, um, at that point, unless you can physically take the child to their room, you're not going to get them to go do something. What you want to do during the time of a blow-up, the actual big explosion time, is just maintain safety as much as you can. Sometimes it's better with certain children just to take yourself and other children or other family members away and out of the room where it's occurring you might want to move certain objects. So if your child's prone to throwing things and you've got, you know, your grandmother's glass vase that's been in the family for, you know, uh, 75 years, you might want to move it uh, if that's a problem. But of course, if your child's prone to this kind of thing, you probably don't have a glass 
face that's 75 years old sitting out at easy hands reach. <laughs> you know, so um, move things if necessary, move people if necessary. Um, uh, but you also want to be maintaining safety. So for instance, you don't want to all just leave the house and go for a walk. You know, you want to be somewhere where you know what's happening with the child. Um, if a child is small enough to be easily moved, um, and it's not going to hurt you, and it's not going to hurt the child. You know that can be an option: is to put them in a, a spot, safe spot, such as their room or some other um, safe place in the house. Uh, but you want to be very careful about physical intervention, and I really recommend against it for the most part because there's just always a risk that the child could get hurt or you could get hurt very inadvertently you know usually just trying to maintain safety someone can accidentally get hurt um, so try to think of any strategy that you can use that doesn't involve getting physical uh, and remember that in most cases you know if a child's flailing around on the floor you know that's not pleasant but you know, it's all right for them to be there. Um, the only time some, you might have to do something otherwise is if the child or someone else is going to be harmed, um, if there isn't some gentle way to restrain them. Um, if you do have to restrain them, I really recommend that you're talking to someone who can give you some suggestions about how to gently restrain someone to limit the chance that you or the other person can get hurt. And if it's someone that um, can't be restrained, easily, you know, by um, you or another adult in the home, you may have to call the police to get some assistance. Um, and if you do, and if it's a special needs child, um, let them know that before you call that you're dealing with a child with autism who's become physically aggressive and is out of control, um, so that they can send someone who has special training um, to your home if that's available in your area. I know it is in the area where I live although the specially trained officers may or may not always be available at any particular point. But it's worth asking um, for that, if that's the case. Um, then after the blow-up, we've got one last phase, and that's called the recovery phase, which is, I feel like at that point the switch has been turned off. You know, it's like at a certain point the switch is turned on, there's this point of no return, there's a big blow-up, and then there's this point at which you just kind of know it's over. But it's not completely over. The person isn't completely calm and so forth, but it's um, sometimes the person starts crying, the child might start crying at that point. Um, if they've been aggressive, the aggression is usually stopped. Um, there's still a lot of emotion, uh, but the worst of the sort of neurological storm is over. And at that point, it's okay to use soothing and comforting. I think you have to be careful about it in earlier stages because you don't want to be reinforcing the negative behavior but when it's over I think it's okay to be soothing to be comforting and just gradually return to the regular routines of the day this is not a good time to process or debrief what triggered the explosion in the first place because some kids might easily get triggered into that explosion or blow up again just by starting to talk about it if the child's bringing it up and really wants to revisit the topic, you can, you know, maybe suggest a time at which that might be a good idea to do that. You know, you probably know your child best about whether that would be, you know, in half an hour or two hours or the next day. Uh, so you could say, well, we might talk about that later, but for now we're just going to return to the routines of the day or whatever it is that would be happening next in the normal um, course of events. Um, you just want to return to the normal day, uh, try to help the child stay calm, uh, and get back to where everyone's brain is functioning, being able to use all those problem-solving parts of their brain and feels calm and, and just sort of move on with the day. A later, much later for some kids, I think it's worthwhile to process it and maybe look for one thing they did well in the situation, although that can be really hard to find, but sometimes you can find something like maybe they usually hit you and this time they didn't, or something along those lines. Um, and also one thing that they could do better. 
again, it's not a time even afterwards to do a lot of lecturing or why do you always do this or what's wrong with you. Usually you do know what's wrong with your child. You know, they've got some difficulties with uh, managing strong emotion under um, certain circumstances. And so we don't want to be uh, lecturing or berating them for it, but help them identify maybe one thing they could do differently next time. And you might go through that same process yourself in your own reflection um, regarding um, how do you think you handle the situation, what's maybe one thing that you did well, and what's one thing you could have done better in retrospect when you look back on it. Uh, so I hope some of these ideas have been helpful about how to get through a major meltdown with your child. Uh, if you found this kind of thing helpful, you can subscribe to my channel, which is AST Specialist. And my name is Barbara Lester. I'm a licensed clinical social worker, and I have about 30 years experience working with children and adolescents and their families. And I specialize in working with kids on the autism spectrum. So thanks for stopping by.